So everybody, here's Pastor Jeff. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. What what Dave uh, didn't seem to remember is that he called my wife Michelle instead right. of Christy. So <laughs> <laughs> it is it is kind of interesting, though, isn't it? How uh, how God works and weaves in our life, and we begin to connect, and it's like wow, all the pieces come together, and uh, God has definitely got our back. Um, I'd love to pray. Uh, would you guys allow me to pray as we get started? God, uh, we come before you today. We uh, want to dig into your word and uh, glean from you. God, we pray that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would continue the transformation and change us from the inside. And so God, we, uh, we thank you for this time. We thank you for uh, this facility. Uh, God, for this facility opening up their doors uh, for us to be able to gather in your name, uh, to be able to break bread together, uh, and to be able to just share uh, about our love for you. And so, God, I just pray that you would move in our midst, that you would minister to your, your people, your little boys, God, that you would help us to continue to grow and to serve you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, kind of interesting and, and fitting, uh, even as we're worshiping and, you know, talking about government and, and talking about, uh, you know, the change in our country. And uh, kind of just what I want to share is maybe just an encouragement, maybe a challenge to some of you about what it really means to be a Christian. You know, a word that's thrown around, a, a word that uh, I associated with my life pretty much since I was a, a child. But... Um, found out through uh, you know my own church experience and and my own relationship now with Jesus Christ that uh, I wasn't a Christian for a lot of my life I, I, I called myself a Christian um, and you know it's it's fitting that uh, you do some surveys and you read things like this you know that 75 percent of Americans uh, would claim to be Christians or Christ followers which means that's three out of four every American would say they're a Christian uh, but then you begin to look at some of the, the issues and the problems that face us today. If you broke that down, you're looking at about 250 million people in our country alone who say they're Christ followers. Yet, when you begin to look around at all the problems in our world, even in our own United States of America, do you know that there are over 600,000 Americans today that are homeless? Uh, many of those, about a quarter of those are children. Um, this year there'll be over a million babies aborted in our nation alone um, and I could go on and on the divorce rate for Christians so-called Christians is somewhere up north about 60 percent right now uh, we we go through all of these different statistics and it kind of makes you throw your hands up in the air and say w what's going on aren't we supposed to be the light the salt different than the world around us and yet we find ourselves in Christianity being much like the world around us and so uh, you know what I, I see is there's maybe a, a redefining in, in our culture and in our day and age of what it means to be a Christian that when we think about what it means to be a Christian just like I see a redefining in my in my own lifetime of, of things like shopping Anybody else relate to this, that when I was a kid, you'd have to go to about six different places to get all of your shopping done, right? Now you just go to Target, as we like to call it, or Walmart, and you can get it all done. I mean, when I was growing up, you'd have to go to the butcher to get your meat, then you'd have to go and get your vegetables somewhere else. If you had any pet supplies, you'd go to the pet store, and so on and so forth. We see a redefining, even of things like uh, our, um, our equipment that we want to be able to do our household chores with. Uh, you know, I remember there being a, a, an area that you would go to get your lumber, that there would be an area you would need to go to get your tools, and now you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot. There's a redefining, even of shopping and I see that there's a redefining of what it means to be a Christian unfortunately as well and so what I want to be able to do is just take a few minutes to be able to go through God's Word to get the real definition of what it means to be a Christian you know it tells us in God's Word his one of his final commissions if you will the Great Commission it says what go and make disciples of all nations 
which is what we're supposed to be first and foremost, right? We are supposed to be disciples. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, interestingly enough, we use the word Christian. The word Christian appears in the Bible three times. The word disciple almost 300 times. And so we sometimes gravitate towards these words, which, hey, there's nothing wrong with calling ourselves Christians. It means to belong to or follow Jesus Christ. But really, when you begin to do your research in the Bible, when they were called Christians, it was used as a term of mockery. Uh, they were calling them little Christ as a way to kind of almost insult them. Uh, but we understand really more the definition of a Christ follower is a disciple. And so what does it mean to be a disciple? You know, I want to kind of start off our journey with this quote from Dondrick B. Uh, Bernhofer who writes, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Uh, if you're familiar at all with this guy, who this guy is, is he was someone who was involved in the time period of Adolf Hitler, someone who stood up for the truth and someone who ended up not only in prison but ended up in a concentration camp. So he knew what it meant to stand for Jesus Christ at all costs. Um, but when we begin to think about what it means in the redefinition of what it means to be a Christian, a disciple, a Christ follower, here's kind of what I want to kind of branch off into. What I see, at least with my own eyes and my own experience, is a lot of Christians, even a lot of churchgoers, are becoming more fans than they are followers. Uh, that we want to exalt certain positions within the church or, or, or certain teachers or certain gifts that are exercised within the church, and we're making these people rock stars instead of just brothers and sisters in Christ. What we need to understand is whether you're a pastor or a worship leader, uh, working in the children's ministry, ushering, just serving faithfully in whatever capacity, we're all the same. God has given us different gifts to be able to become the body of Christ so that we can truly represent Jesus Christ for who He is. Uh, we can't do it alone. That's why the church exists, right? If we could all be silos and all just go around and, and do what we're supposed to do, then we wouldn't have to have the church. Because I don't know about you, I've been around the church long enough to know that sometimes the church hurts, doesn't it? Sometimes the church hurts us. Sometimes the church hurts others. And really it's because we're redefining within this parameter of what Jesus Christ defined the church to be, and it's becoming something it was never intended to be. It's becoming a place where we are now seeing fans, and instead of participating within the body of Christ, we feel like it's okay to just to cheer on the people who are leading the body of Christ. We're not called to be cheerleaders. We're called to be participants within the body. That the Bible tells us that each one of us has a gift, that as they are knit together, we become the true body of Christ that's able to go out and to change the world around us. You know, when we talk about politicians. I know we have all of our own opinions and thoughts and ideas, but the reality is is that it's not going to take Donald Trump to make America great again. It's going to take Christ's followers to make America great again. Amen. That's what our nation was founded upon. That's why it became what it became is because we had men and women who were willing to stand up for the truth of who Jesus Christ was, to be there for one another, to be the loving arms of Jesus Christ, to be what God has intended every human being to be. That's what made America great once and will make it great once again. It's not about a politician. It's not about a political party. It's about Christ's followers being who God has called them to truly be. You know, many of us have heard some of these scripture references, but let me hit them just as a source of reminder. When Jesus spoke to his disciples, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up or pick up his cross, and die daily. We understand what this means. I think most of us have been around the Christian circle and the Christian table long enough. But when we begin to dissect and think about, there's really two parts. One of them is self-denial, right? Dying to self. I think most of us get that. But it says to pick or to take up your cross. You know, really that reference is saying that it's a choice that we all make. And in this portion of Scripture, it actually says to do it daily. 
Do you know that every day we make a choice on whether we're truly going to be who Christ has called us to be or not? Uh, it's not just a one-time trip to the altar. Hey, things are good. I'm going to be perfect from here on out. How many would give me an amen to know that that's not your experience? Amen. Right? I mean, there's one day you're cooking good, and the next day you're like, oh, man, I crashed and burned today, Lord. Help me. Forgive me. Uh, daily, we need to make a choice to be able to say, God, I'm picking up my cross today. Lead me. I, I want to follow you. I want to I wanna truly impact the world around us. I want to be able to give you a couple of things, first of all, by defining what it's not, what Christianity is not. What Christianity is not is simply what you believe. Now let me explain myself because we would all kind of push back. I, I thought it was about believing in Christ. Well, you know, it tells us in the book of James that even the demons believe and tremble at the truth of who Jesus Christ is. But how many of you guys know that the demons aren't going to inhabit heaven with Christians and with those Christ followers? See, see, it's not just simply a belief up in your head. And I think that that's where the redefinition sometimes of Christianity comes, is where in our culture we've grown up. If you're like me, you've grown up with parents who maybe took you to Christmas and, and Easter services, because that was the American tradition in my family. I mean, that was what it meant to be a good American. Uh, I, I had great parents who, 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 you know, loved me and loved the family and loved our community and were very traditional. And so we would do these things, but it was just knowledge. And so I grew up saying, if someone would say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you a, are you a, a Christian? I would be, absolutely. Um, but I didn't know what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. It wasn't just simply head belief. It wasn't intellectual, you see. What we need to realize is that being a Christian is not just intellectual, it's relational. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relationship with God more directly through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we need to not only ask ourselves, in my mind, what do I believe, but what does that mean to me? What does it mean to my everyday life? Not only that, do you know that Christianity is not based on what you do, or do not do. You see, for some people, it's like, well, you know, I mean, uh, I'm trying to clean up my life. I, I've had some bad patches, but uh, now I, I need to, to avoid certain behaviors. I, I, I need to, to stop going to R-rated movies. Uh, you know, I can't go to any more Harry Potter films. Uh, I, I, I can't celebrate Halloween. And, I, I, and, and we begin to, to lay out these parameters, these rules, and sometimes people can have a false sense of security because they feel like I'm not doing these things any longer. How many of you would agree it's not just simply about what you do and don't do that makes you a Christ follower? There's a set of rules that anybody can put before anybody, and we can try to jump through all of the hoops and do all of the right things, but we're still going to stand before the Lord, and you know what the Lord tells us that many will hear. It tells us in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not take this action in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Do this religious exercise in your name? And did we not do many other mighty works? And I will say to them, depart from me for I never knew you. How many of you by a show of hands have ever read that scripture and it freaked you out just a little bit? Uh, th that, that'll rattle your cage a little bit, won't it, guys? Uh, I remember reading that and going, I don't know, what, what can I do then? I, I'm trying to do all the right things. And again, you see, these things have to match. That's what the book of James is teaching us, right? That faith without works is what? It's dead. It's not, there's no life to it. We're just going through the motions. And I don't know about your experience, but my experience has been this. It's really hard for me because I'm a performance-oriented guy. I always felt like I would be approved of by even my father because of the performance element in my life. That if I hit enough home runs, if I stole enough bases, if I pitched enough innings, if I was successful enough in this arena or that arena, then I could get the affirmation that I was looking for. Not that that was what my dad had put before me, but that's in my own spirit, in my own life. That's what I had believed. 
And so now I bring that into my relationship with God, and how easy is it to just kind of just say, well, this is kind of the norm. So I guess if I jump through enough hoops and do enough right things and avoid enough bad things, then I'm going to stand before God one day and He's going to say, come on in, good boy. It's not what it's about. It's not just about a, a report card. It's not just about some kind of grade I get. It's about who I am on the inside, you see. You know, there's a, a portion of Scripture that talks about a couple of encounters that Jesus has, and I want to share for just a moment. If you guys have your Bibles, you can open them up. I don't know if you guys bring your Bibles to this or not. But it's found in, first, or in John chapter 1. And this is really where I want to kind of focus in on, and then we'll bring it to a close and a challenge. But it tells us in John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, of this early encounter of Jesus Christ to one of these who would become a disciple of His. It starts out in verse 35, chapter 1, and says, The next day again John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus and he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, remember these disciples, it's talking about disciples of John the Baptist, right? We, most of us don't understand John the Baptist came on, baptizing in repentance, preparing the way for Jesus Christ. And so these were some of those that were helping him, that were following his direction at this point. And so now there's an encounter with John and a few of these guys that were hanging out with John and they see Jesus Christ. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. You see, it wasn't just about seeing Jesus. It wasn't about being a part of this crew with John, and he says, hey, there, there's the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And they say, well, that's really cool. I got to see him. Man, I'm a big fan of his. What was their next step? Hey, John, it's been good, good hanging with you, bro. I mean, thanks for the direction. Thanks for the encouragement. It's time for me to go follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. It was about following Jesus. It wasn't about looking at Jesus or being a fan of Jesus Christ. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. <coughs> So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, and it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. His, uh, his first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found the one whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Then Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree and I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God and the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, quite a, quite a, a mouthful, but let me kind of break it down because I want to give you context. I'm a firm believer in context in God's Scripture. It's not just about some motivational scripture that's going to get you guys rolling. It's about understanding the Word of God. It's about being able to truly filter every decision that we make through the truth of God's Word. It's not about some you know, talk that some pastor gives you or some encouragement that a brother gives you. It's about taking all of those things and filtering and sifting them through the truth of God's Word and then taking action. 
And, and what we see here in the context of this encounters with Jesus Christ, and there's some common elements. The common elements we see is, first of all, Jesus gives an invitation. Come and see. Come and see. You remember these disciples, the first ones come to him, and they're with John, and all of a sudden it says, hey, we're going to follow Jesus. And it's almost kind of like the puppy dog follow at first, right? It's kind of like, hey, where are you going? Where are you going, Jesus? Uh, where are you staying tonight? You know? And he's like, come and see. So it's kind of this invitation to come in and understand who I am. Uh, let's spend some time together. Maybe let's have some meals together. Let's have some conversations. And we see this over and over where Jesus gives an invitation. And the truth in this, what we need to understand is Jesus gives an invitation. But we must pick up the cross and follow him. The invitation has been given to all men, but not all men will extend that invitation into a relationship with him. There's an invitation to know Jesus Christ, and then there's a direction. And this is really where we want to park for just a moment. He says, follow me. That we are given the invitation to come and see. But then when we begin to understand who Jesus is, and maybe we sit in a church pew, or maybe we begin to get some Bible knowledge, Jesus says, now will you follow my direction? Will you follow my direction? You know, one thing that I know about myself, and as we get more mature in age, we begin to understand truth about who we are is I am someone who has always been, from a very young age, very driven. Very driven. I don't need a lot of motivation. The motivation comes from within. I am driven. Not only am I driven, I am very dedicated. I, I, I am someone who is determined to make something take place. But I'm also very dumb. I'm also very dumb sometimes. I make bad decisions because I don't have great direction. Because for much of my life, my direction has come from my flesh. It's come from my selfish desires. It's come from what I want. And when Jesus came into my life and gave me direction, it helped me to take that next step in my journey to say, this, this is where I really need to go. And how many of you have experienced when you begin to follow Jesus' directions, your life changes in an amazing way, amen? amen? It's no longer taking a couple of steps and you're like, wow, this is really cool, and then falling off the edge of a cliff and going, well, I guess maybe it wasn't that great. The, the end result wasn't what I was hoping it was going to be. That was much of my experience as I had the drive and I had the determination, but I did not have the direction that I needed. Jesus Christ bought that direction when he said, follow me. You know, we understand what it means to be a Christ follower, but my question and my challenge to you guys as we close this message is simply this, are you following Jesus Christ? Are you falling deeper and deeper in love with him today than you were yesterday? Or are you beginning to go through the motions? Because in my church experience, what I've experienced personally is this. At times I can get comfortable. Hey, I, I kind of got a lot of the Bible knowledge. I, I know most of the stories. I can, I can fake it till I make it at most of the Christian events I attend. And, and you know, people, are, can, we can have the conversations. But when I honestly look in the, the mirror of my own heart, have I grown in my personal relationship with Jesus Christ? in the recent history of my life. Today, the experience that we're all having and being able to fellowship with one another is great. But you know, even this is a means to an end. The means to the end and the end result isn't so I get to know a few more Christian brothers. The end is so that I can know Jesus more intimately today. So that you will be an influence. So we will be the iron that sharpens iron. So that I will be encouraged by your story. And you will be encouraged by mine. And I can give you a word that might help you on your journey. But the end is not the relationships in this room. The end is the relationship with the creator of the universe. The one who died for our very lives. That's the end result. That's heaven. You know, I, I do a lot of funerals. Obviously, I've been a pastor for almost 25 years. I get all of that stuff. And all of those things are great in their place. But the reality is when we get to heaven, heaven isn't heaven because our relatives are there. I'm sorry. I, I want to see some of my relatives too. Don't get me wrong. Heaven is heaven because God is there. Because Jesus Christ is there. 
Not because your long lost aunt is there or your you know, past wife or child or any of those other things which add to the experience. But can I tell you, even if none of those people were there and Jesus was there, it would still be heaven. And so I encourage all of us and even encourage myself today, what am I doing to increase my relationship and my intimacy level with Jesus Christ? I close with this true statement. Do you realize that discipleship is intentional? It's not accidental. That what are you doing intentionally today to build your relationship with Jesus Christ? In any relationship in your life, and the most important one is with God, are you being intentional in how you can grow in that relationship? Some of us are married men in this room. If you want to grow in your intimacy with your wife, you need to be intentional about it. It doesn't just happen accidentally. Well, you know, I was just hoping we got closer, but it doesn't seem like it's happening. What are you doing? Or are you taking her out on dates? Are you doing the things that you know will help the relationship grow? It's the same exact principle when it comes to Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you know, I, I'm just I'm trying to be a good guy, but it doesn't seem like I'm any closer to Jesus today. What have you done to try to draw closer to Jesus today? Have you spent time in His Word? Have you spent time in prayer? Have you spent time serving Him? You know, the greatest joy in my life is to serve Jesus Christ. It's something I experienced nearly 30 years ago. My wife asked me to serve with her in the nursery. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I put it off for a few weeks. Some of you guys can identify. Like, you know, you, you hear all the old, you know, happy life, happy wife, all that, right? And you're like, okay, eventually I'm going to have to cave into this deal and I'm going to do it. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, man, a bunch of nursery kids? I barely even like my own kids at this point. You know what I mean? And, and so I experienced this for the very first time. And, and I still can't even explain it. I can't articulate it properly. But I left that time of serving Jesus Christ and I was hooked. And I didn't do anything special. I signed a couple of babies in, talked to their parents a little bit, you know, ran a couple errands for the wife, did whatever she needed me to do, and then we went home. But it was the fulfillment that came from serving Jesus Christ. And why? Because I had now become a disciple of Jesus Christ. I had followed his direction as simple as it was. Hey, go serve in the nursery today. That sounds pretty simple. But when you make that connection relationally with Jesus Christ and take those steps in faith, it fulfills your heart. Amen? Amen. It's something that we can't explain. And I pray that every human being that exists could experience that same experience I had. That's what drives me each and every day. That's what causes me to wake up in the morning. That's something that I want to be able to share with people who are missing out on it. And so I pray that groups like this would continue to grow that fellowship would be sweet, but I pray that this would always be the means to the true end, and that is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, huh? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for these men. I thank you for this ministry. But God, most importantly, I thank you for Jesus Christ. God, I know who I am without Jesus. And it's an ugly picture. It's an empty life. It's far from fulfilling. There's a lot of dead ends. There's a lot of pain. And so God, I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for the love that you show to each and every one of us. That while we were still sinners, while we were still your enemies, your word declares, fighting against you, that Jesus, you died for us. As Christ followers, God, may we have the heart that you have. May we serve you faithfully. May we love you intentionally. May we go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ faithfully. But God, we need your spirit we need your strength to accomplish any of those things. So God, I pray for the men in this room. God, I pray you would make us a mighty army today. That God, we would not just be those who filled our bellies 
and maybe even filled our own personal hearts, but that we would be filled to overflowing today. That God, your love would not only flow in us, but it would flow through us this day. That God, you would give us an encounter that could change someone's life today. Because God, you've changed ours. God, we thank you for the opportunity you put before us to truly follow you. Cause us to be the disciples that you called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.